Well, tonight I'm going to be talking about the new atheists and considering whether they've got anything actually new to say. But who are they? Well, of course, most people have heard of Richard Dawkins now, zoologist from Oxford University and a colleague of mine. There's Christopher Hitchens, a Marxist uh, from the United States, Sam Harris from the United States, Daniel Dennett, a philosopher who was a pupil with me of Gilbert Ryle in Oxford many years ago. Uh, and those are some of the uh, names of the new uh, atheists who have really propagated a, a very virulent form of atheism, uh, which is more evangelical than any Christians manage to be, and uh, has founded a website uh, which calls them the Brights. They are the Brights, and uh, we, people like me, are the Dims, so I just have to put up with that, really. What is new about these new atheists? Atheism is actually not very new. I mean, there have always been atheists in the world, but no philosopher of any note has ever been an atheist until Nietzsche. Uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes, possibly, but he didn't write about uh, metaphysics. So all the classical philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, you know, Leibniz, uh, Spinoza, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, uh, the whole canon of Western philosophy has been theistic, has taken the most rational view of the universe to be one which uh, sees the universe as created by uh, uh, an intelligent creator, by God. Uh, Nietzsche wasn't, I think, a great philosopher. He was a great aphorist, uh, and he, of course, did say God is dead. But the new atheism has only got going with a particular interpretation of modern science, it's a peculiar interpretation, and tonight I shall argue it's already obsolete as an interpretation of science. And it's interesting that most people who claim that science is atheistic are not physicists or mathematicians. They're zoologists, as Richard Dawkins is, or biologists. In other words, they deal with dirty stuff in laboratories that make funny smells, uh, and they don't concern themselves with the real, tough, ultimate matter of the universe as physicists do. I shall elaborate on that a little bit further. But let me quote one person, Richard Lewontin from the United States, who says this, we, uh, I don't know who the we is, it's him and his friends, really, we take the side of science because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that commitment is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That statement was made by Lewontin, who is a Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist, uh, in a book review, but still he presumably meant it. So science has a prior commitment to materialism, does it? That's the question I want to consider. And I would argue that actually modern science, far from having a commitment to materialism, undermines materialism comprehensively. But of course, not in biology, which is not really concerned with questions like that, but in physics, where the notion of matter has become extremely obscure. Physicists wouldn't use the word matter, in fact. Uh, they would prefer to use the word energy. Matter is one possible form of energy, as we know from the one equation that everybody knows, E equals mc squared. So matter is actually interchangeable with energy and the many other forms of energy. And most physicists these days agree there are lots of immaterial things. Uh, let me give you one example. Supposing you ask the question, as Stephen Hawking does, for example, uh, how did the universe begin? What accounts for the Big Bang 13.7 uh, thousand million years ago? That's when the universe began. It was very, very small, infinite density, infinite mass, and it exploded, expanded into the universe we now have over that period of time. But it's a proper question in science, how, can we explain how it began? If you can't explain it, then science has come to an end. You say, here's something we just can't explain in science. And of course, physicists don't like saying that. They want to say, no, oh, there must be some sort of explanation. So what they often do is to say, well, um, there must be some laws, quantum laws, laws of quantum reality from which the universe uh, originated. And this, these laws must be beyond space and time. And that's because this universe, of course, is space and time. Space and time is what's in this universe. We live in space and time now. But if you're looking at the early universe, uh, at the regime of the Big Bang, you're talking about something beyond space and time. Now, this is very intriguing. And a lot of physicists would say, well, what we have to see is that there are worlds beyond this. There are things beyond this universe. That is, there are things beyond space and time. 
And that reality beyond space and time is probably mathematical in its nature. I mean, there are quantum laws. Uh, one popular uh, physical explanation for this is to say, well, there are energies like gravitational energy, which pulls things together, and inflationary energy, which pushes things apart. And in the regime before this universe began, if I shouldn't really say before, but I can't think of any other word to use because, of course, there wasn't a before this universe began because when this universe began, that was the beginning of time. Okay? So there's no before. I mean, there's no, nothing before the beginning of time. But anyway, apart from the beginning of time, beyond time altogether, there are these balancing energies, which uh, some physicists call a quantum vacuum. Right? And you say, this is a quantum phenomenon in their simplest possible state, the vacuum state. Uh, so, this may not make any sense to you at all, but it's what physicists talk about. Whether it does make sense, I, I uh, don't know. But, but let's suppose it does make sense. The point is this. Physicists are talking about things beyond space and time. Now, what we call natural, the natural world, is this space-time world. That's the natural world with things in it. And anything beyond the natural world is, of course, super natural. It's beyond this world of space and time. And these days, physicists regularly talk about the supernatural. That is, they talk about things beyond space and time from which space and time originated. Not only that, they talk about it as something elegant and beautiful. Now, again, if you're not a mathematician, you may not agree that mathematics can be elegant and beautiful, but all mathematicians will agree there's a big difference between a beautiful piece of mathematics and an ugly piece of mathematics, and that's what's really important when you do maths. So that world beyond space and time is a world of beauty and elegance and immensely intricate uh, intelligibility. It can be understood. It works in a rational sort of way. Now, this is very interesting because it means that the best science now, which is, of course, quantum physics, the best science now talks about the supernatural and a world beyond space and time from which space and time originate. And it talks about the supernatural as rational, as intelligible, as beautiful, and as elegant. And that can hardly fail to remind me and people like me of that first statement in St. John's Gospel that in the beginning was reason, intelligibility, logos, translated in, into English often as the word, but it really means something more like intellect or rationality. And the word was with God. The word was God. So in a way, the Christian faith has been saying uh, since it started uh, that this world is a rational structure, that space and time are not self-explanatory, that they need to be explained by something beyond space and time. And that beyond is rational, it is intelligible, it is beautiful. So science and faith come very close together. It is not true at all uh, that science is opposed to faith. The point is people like Richard Dawkins don't deal with these questions because they're dealing with evolution, with biology, and they're concerned with historical things that have happened. But if you probe really deep down into the nature of this universe, you might find that you're driven beyond this universe of space and time into the supernatural. Now, scientists, I confess, hate the word supernatural because they think supernatural means ghosts and spirits and queer goings on of various sorts. But actually, it's strictly true that the regime, the multiverse, that which exists beyond this space-time, is supernatural. And if it has a mathematical quality, well, that's important. And there's something else about it, too. It's not only elegant and beautiful, it seems to have the nature of consciousness, and that is very intriguing. Now, if you talk to any quantum physicist as you walk down the street in Perth, you might ask them, well, uh, is consciousness an ultimate element of reality? And you may be surprised to know that they will say, even if they don't think so, they will say, many of my colleagues in physics think it is. And let me just explain in brief why that is true. Why is consciousness ultimate in reality? Because the reason I'm talking about this is because God is a consciousness. God is a supreme consciousness. God knows. God intends. And so God is conscious, clearly. And the question is, is that regime beyond this universe, beyond space and time, conscious in any sense? Would that make any sense? And the reason it would is this, for a quantum physicist. 
what is an electron? Okay. Most of you will have done some physics in school anyway, and you will know that an electron, ah, oh, well, will you know what an electron is? Probably not. Because what we get taught in schools about electrons is they're like little planets which circle in orbits around the nucleus, the center of an atom. So they're like little planets, they're solid things which have a particular place and location and move at a particular speed. Well, let me tell you, that is false. That is simply not true. That's for school kids. They can more or less, it's a bit like religion. You tell people simple things because they can't understand complicated things, all right? But the dip, the, it all goes wrong if you think that the simple things you've been told are the true things. What you've got to see is the simple things are not the true things. They're just ways in which most of us can understand them. Uh, but actually, a physicist uh, is able to understand electrons much better. And a physicist, I've asked plenty of physicists about this, and they all tell me the same thing. It doesn't make any sense, but here goes. An electron is a probability wave in Hilbert space. What is Hilbert space? Well, it's logical space. It's a, it's a space of all logically possible states of affairs. It's not an actual space like this one, uh, but it's a state of possibilities, a space of possibilities. What is a probability wave? Well, you know what a wave is. It goes like that. Uh, but a probability wave isn't an actual wave. It's a wave of probability. It's in Hilbert space. It's in conceptual space. And what a probability wave does is it tells you that if you take the square of the amplitude, how big it is that way, if you take the square of the amplitude of a probability wave, you get the probability of finding an electron at a particular location if you carry out a specific experiment. Now, what's the point of all this? The point of all this is to say reality is nothing like any of us can imagine. If you try to say, what is reality really like? It's not made of little hard balls bumping into one another. That's obsolete science. That is absolutely false. Nobody believes that in physics anymore. Those little hard balls have collapsed. They've all gone. Uh, they don't bump into each other. So where are they? Well, you can't say. In fact, let me quote John von Neumann, one of the greatest quantum physicists, all elements of reality are elements of consciousness. There's consciousness coming in. So how does that happen? Well, these probability waves in Hilbert space collapse, the wave function collapses into the perception of an object when and only when it is observed. Precisely when it's measured, but of course the measurement is ready to be observed at some future time. And there's the intriguing thing about modern physics that this whole world appears only to be the way it is when we look at it. In fact, this is the view which was held by one of the, in my view, the greatest bishops of the Anglican Church, Bishop Barclay, many years ago. I walk over Bishop Barclay every day when I'm in Oxford. He, uh, he's buried in Christchurch Cathedral, and every time I walk over him, I think, oh, yes, well, he's not really there. <laughs> Unless I look at him. And, of course, that was Barclay's view. Things only exist when you look at them. Now, you may think this is absurd, but let me, let me try and make it less absurd. We're all sitting here in this uh, cathedral, and we've all got different colored clothes on, so we know there are lots of colors in this cathedral. Now, uh, I asked you the question that Bishop Barclay asked, what would things look like if we weren't looking at them? And you might feel, well, they look like what they look like when we are looking at them. The first point is, how do you know? How do you know what things look like when you're not looking at them? Well, close your eyes, then you open them very quickly just to see what they're like. No, it doesn't work, because you're still only seeing them when you look at them. Are they like what they look like when you look at them, when you're not looking at them? I can tell you, certainly not. Because all the colors that you see are actually not existent in the physical world. Things don't have color. Colors in the physical world are electromagnetic waves, which when and only when they hit the cones of your eyes and are transmitted by electrical impulses to your visual cortex, then color begins to exist. Some animals, lots of animals, don't see in color at all. Some people are colorblind. We see different colors. So color is a function of the mind. 
And the mind coming into contact with electromagnetic waves through the medium of the eyes and the brain, the visual cortex, through that medium, the mind sees a world of colors, but those colors aren't really there. They're there when you look at them, but when you don't look at them, what you've got are electromagnetic waves. They're those waves again. They're what sort of existence do waves have? You don't actually see them. So quantum physicists take this even further, and they say not only do colors only exist when you see them, the whole world only exists when you see it. That world of probability waves in Hilbert space collapses into ordinary physical objects only when it is observed by consciousness. We can't even imagine what it's like when we're not observing it. We all look like solid bodies. Here we are, solid bodies, made of solid stuff. We bump into one another, that's solid enough. But actually, any physicist will tell you when actually all of us are almost entirely empty space. Right? There's some atoms, quite a lot of atoms in there, but they're very, very small. Most of us is empty space. So why don't we go through each other? Well, we might, but... It doesn't seem as though we do. To us, things look solid. But again, that's what they look like. So the lesson from physics is that Plato, that ancient old Greek, was right after all. The world that we see and touch and feel and think we live in is a world of appearances. It's not the world of reality. It's the world as it appears to people with our sense organs and our brains the world seen through that lens of human bodies. But the world is not like that at all. And things, of course, in physics have got this stage now where people can hardly understand, what, even physicists can hardly understand uh, what's going on, but some friends of mine in Oxford are making quantum computers. Now, you've probably heard about quantum computers, but just think what they are. If you have an ordinary computer, it will do calculations in this space and time. That, your computer has a place, it's in space and time, there it is. It does its calculations in space and time. A quantum computer would do calculations in two or three different spaces and times at the same time. Right. So it can carry out a number of operations in different spaces at the same time. Now, what on earth are they talking about? Where are these different spaces? Well, obviously, there are different technical ways of trying to explain this, but the point is that we've even got things. We do have... Uh, one of my friends has become a millionaire by inventing a quantum cryptography lock, which has been bought by all the banks because nobody can break it. It's an unbreakable code because it's not in this space at all, so nobody can find where it is. Right? You look around, and it's not in space, so what can you do? It's a one-time code that is totally unbreakable, quantum cryptography. Now, it's a mysterious world. You've probably, well, I'm sure you've seen television uh, films and uh, big films uh, which talk about quantum leaps, quantum jumps into other spaces and time. Well, that's not ridiculous. I mean, the programs are usually ridiculous, but the idea is not ridiculous. So that you, it is actually, people are dealing with what they call, some physicists are called many worlds theory. I don't know if you've come across this. Many worlds theory is this, that uh, electrons, which I talking about for some reason. Electrons are not just things which have one location in space and a particular velocity at which they're moving. Electrons have a number of locations. They are superposed. There are a number of positions that they have. Or you can say they're at all those positions. They're, they're fuzzy. They're in lots of different places. Uh, or you could say there are lots of different spaces in which they exist. And the many worlds theory is that every possible space that an electron could be in, it is in. So there are many worlds. Put this in a picture form, and it's here I am standing here in this place, but I'm also standing in a slightly different position in another adjacent space. So I'm giving this talk in this space, but I'm giving a different talk in another space. Perhaps I'm an atheist in another space. That would be rather distressing. But we might exist in lots of different spaces. And the many worlds theory, which again, most of my physicist colleagues quantum physicists anyway, in Oxford, accept is that every possible world does exist. Now, why they believe this um, is a complicated question, but there are reasons why they believe it. It's to do with the nature of quantum physics and the fact that physics has passed beyond this space and time into worlds beyond space and time. 
Now, consciousness comes into this because these strange superposed particles which exist in a number of different spaces, logically speaking, collapse into this space and time when they are observed. And that's how consciousness can come to seem very important in physics. I don't want to give the impression that all quantum physicists believe this. There are other interpretations, but a lot of Nobel Prize winning top quantum physicists do believe this, and they think that without consciousness, there wouldn't be any physical world. There wouldn't be the world in which we live and move and have our being. So without consciousness, no world. Isn't that amazing? How could you be a materialist and say that? I mean, a materialist is a person who says there isn't any consciousness. Daniel Dennett, who's the most extreme of all materialists, has wrote a book, written a book called Consciousness Explained, which most of us call, privately, Consciousness Explained Away. Because what he says is, consciousness is nothing but physical states of the brain. That's what it is. So instead of saying I'm conscious, I could say my brain is in state 423, and that's all there is to it. Francis Crick, uh, one of the uh, in, uh, discoverers of the structure of DNA, of which there were three, but nobody knows there were three. Everybody knows there were two, Crick and Watson, but I seem to be the only person who knows there were three because the third man was a friend of mine. Anyway, three people got the Nobel Prize. That's just by the way. So Crick wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, and in that book, Crick says, you, your feelings, your thoughts, your beliefs, all that you think about, you are nothing more than movements of neurons, electrons, basically, in your brain. That's all you are. You're just electrons. You're just a whole bottle of electrons. Well, that is what is bound to be wrong. That is materialism. Consciousness is just the brain. But actually, what a lot of quantum physicists say is, actually, the brain is nothing but consciousness. Or well, without consciousness we wouldn't ever even see or know or touch or feel a brain. And here's the biggest controversy, the biggest argument, the biggest philosophical argument about reality in the whole world today. Is consciousness the ultimate nature of reality, without which there wouldn't be any physical reality? Or is everything just made of physical bits bumping into one another so consciousness Consciousness is a sort of side effect which comes about by accident. Which of those views is true? Now, the new atheists say, well, the materialist view is true. I gave you that quotation from Richard Lewinton. We are bound to be materialists as scientists. What I'm saying is that is as false. It's a lie. It's as false as any statement could be because most of the best physicists in the world today do not believe that. First of all, they're not sure what matter is, so you can't be a materialist. It's some form of energy, but it could take many different forms. There are many space-times, and they're all different. And secondly, probably matter couldn't exist without some form of consciousness in the sense in which we experience the material universe requires consciousness. So you're not going to have a material world without consciousness. That's the opposite of materialism. So that's the point I want to make at this stage, that actually science does not support materialism. State-of-the-art science, particularly in physics and mathematics, supports a view which transcends materialism, which makes consciousness very important, which makes the mathematical structure of the universe very important. In physics now, you can't imagine what's going on. Um, I mean, I've been to the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, it's a rather boring place to go because all you've got is a very long tube which goes around the earth and uh, uh, nothing in it except uh, some magnets which don't work made in America. But uh, <laughs> when they get it working, it's going to be the biggest thing on earth and it will make uh, subatomic particles go very, very fast and crash into one another and some people think make a black hole down which we will all disappear. But anyway, whether or, so if it doesn't work, that's a good thing, basically. So uh, in this Large Hadron Collider, what they're doing is they're looking for Higgs boson, which is misleadingly called the God particle. Maybe you've heard of the God particle. It is a Higgs boson. And some people think this has got something to do with religion. In fact, a colleague of mine, the Bishop of Oxford, was asked to go and give a talk uh, at a literary festival on the God particle because they thought a bishop is the person to ask about the God particle. Of course, Richard didn't have the slightest idea what the God particle was. Well, I mean, <laughs> why is it called the God particle? The answer, the answer is it's called because uh, Dr. Higgs, who thought of the idea, said, 
God knows what this is. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's called the God particle. Anyway, they're going to be looking for it. Uh, but the point is, this particle, is, which is what makes gravity work on the whole, which gives things mass, or it's, it's, it's not a particle, really. It's a wave, as I've explained to you. Particles are really waves, so they're not really particles. Uh, so, but they're looking for it, and it's a purely theoretical construction. Uh, nobody's ever seen one. We don't know if there is one. We're going to look for one. But every experiment costs about $2 million, you know, so we probably not have many experiments, not, not if it's funded by the UK anyway. So you're going to find it very difficult. What has happened is this. Science is no longer something which just looks, observes, and records what it sees. That's not science. That's old-fashioned stuff. What science does is invent hypotheses which are purely mathematical in form because they are beautiful. The quantum physicist from Cambridge, Paul Dirac, uh, one of the greatest quantum physicists, was asked why he invented the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. And he said, because I just thought of the most beautiful equations I could. To most of us, they don't make sense, but he found them to be beautiful. Beauty was he, the thing he thought of. Isaac Newton, that great scientist from England who really started modern science, uh, said the same thing in his great work, Principia Mathematica, 1637, I think. He said, uh, 1673, sorry. He said, well, uh, the reason I thought of the laws of nature, the laws of gravity, the laws of uh, mechanics, is because they were the most beautiful and simplest laws that would be made by an intelligent creator of the universe. And Isaac Newton was a very devout theist. And his reason for inventing those laws where he said, these are the laws an intelligent creator would devise to get the richest possible set of effects out of the simplest set of laws. So religion is not far away from good science. When you get down to the ultimate questions about, is nature beautiful? Is it intelligible? Why should it be if it's just an accident by chance? But it might be if actually the creator of nature is a being who values beauty and intelligence and who is itself complete beauty and intelligence. So that ideal, which is God, of course, is there at the root of science. Not all scientists have to believe it. Uh, they don't have to believe that this God has anything to do with what goes on in churches. They very often don't. Whether you go to church or not, that's a different matter. But if you're asking the question, is consciousness, is intelligence involved in the basic structure of the universe, most physicists would say probably yes. Albert Einstein said yes. Uh, intelligence and consciousness is somehow involved in the structure of the universe. You remember one of his most famous reported sayings, God does not play dice with the universe. He was actually wrong about that. <laughs> but what he meant by saying that was that the universe is so intelligible, it's such a rational structure, that there can't be random events in it. Now, Einstein was almost certainly wrong about that because quantum physics has shown that there are random events, but only within limits. The random events are within very strictly controlled limits. And randomness, of course, allows creativity and freedom and change to occur, as well as the repetitiveness that nothing but law would allow. Now, it may sound as though this is a sort of elementary physics lecture, but it, it's not that at all. It's, it's asking the question, does science commit you to materialism? And the new atheists' view is that it does, and that's why the new atheists believe in old-fashioned and obsolete science. If you talk about state-of-the-art physics, you're going to say, well, the whole thing is so mysterious that we couldn't make any dogmatic statement about it, but it looks as though consciousness is very important to the universe we live in and know about and talk about and see, and it looks as though the universe is intelligible. We invent things like the Higgs boson, the God particle, because we're looking for ultimate rationality and intelligibility and beauty, not because we've actually found one, but because this is the most elegant theory that would exist to explain why the universe is the way it is. So that commitment to rationality and beauty is a scientific commitment. The reason some scientists don't like talking about God is because they have a very primitive idea of God. And that's the next thing I'll talk about. So what I've said so far is that the best science 
believes in an intelligent and beautiful and supernatural, but beyond space and time, origin for this universe. And I want to say that's actually the traditional Christian view of God. The next thing I want to say is, why don't they see that? Why can't they see it? Why, why do they deride and paddy, parody belief in God? Um, A.C. Grayling, who's a philosopher in Britain who sometimes ill-advisedly makes remarks about religion, talks about God in the same breath as talking about fairies. And he says, well, I don't believe in fairies, you know, little things which paint the bluebells blue when we're not looking. And so I don't believe in a God who is the same sort of supernatural figment of the imagination who paints things when we're not looking. Right? And that's a parody of any religious belief. It makes religion into something stupid. Of course, that's what... But why do they want to make religion into something stupid when it's actually been believed by the most intelligent people in the history of the world? What would make them do that? And it's I, hard to say what... Uh, makes them do that, but it, it's due to a complete ignorance of what religion is. Let me take an example. Let's talk about for a moment the ancient Greek gods. We know they don't exist, so I'm safe in talking about them. All right. The ancient Greek gods, what were they? Well, the new atheists tend to say, well, the ancient Greek gods were allegedly scientific explanations. Here's science again, you see. They were scientific explanations of why things happened. So if the sun comes up in the morning, there's a goddess called Aurora, great big, huge, but invisible goddess, who drags up the sun and puts it in the sky. And that was an explanation. Why does the sun rise? Because some goddess is making it rise. And then they have no difficulty in showing that that explanation is unnecessary and stupid. Right? Uh, and so they say, well, that's what religion is like. It's like having some invisible figure who makes things happen. And they say, well, Christians are just like that. They, they believe God is an intelligent being who's making things happen all the time. But we don't need that being. We've got laws of nature. Of course, the irony is it's the very laws of nature which point to the existence of an intelligent creator, but they don't see that. But they're wrong about the Greek gods and goddesses. Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, was never a scientific explanation. So at this point, I want to make clear distinction between a scientific explanation and a religious perception of the universe. And I want to suggest this, of course, we know there's such a distinction. People who come to church don't put on their lab coats and come with microscopes when they come to church and perform scientific experiments. People who pray don't pray as an experiment. Well, I jolly well hope they don't, to see whether it works, you know. Uh, they would be slightly fishy if people, uh, well, people have tried this, you know. They prayed for one group and not for another group and see which group does better. But mm, can, there's something wrong with that. There's something ethically obscure and spiritually obscurantist about such a procedure. Prayer isn't an experiment. It's precisely not that. Uh, to pray to God in that way is rather like experimenting on your wife and carrying out tests to see whether she loves you or not. Um, and I think that would be offensive. Uh, certainly, I would take offense if my wife tried that on me. Uh, it's rather a matter of personal relationship. And personal relationships are not scientific experiments. There's something different about it. And what's different about it? But a scientific experiment treats things as objects. You've got them there. You can play around with them. You can alter them. You can take bits out, put bits in. You can control them, and you can put them in test situations. That's uh, an objective attitude. But personal relationships are not like that. You have to be involved. If you have a real relationship with another person, you have to give yourself to them. You have to open up a little bit to them, and you hope that they're opening up to you. And you're not in an experimental situation. Perhaps there's a website somewhere which is a dating site where it says carry out an experiment on somebody you know, tonight and uh, take her out to dinner and see what happens. But it's not really an experiment. And if you went into it in that frame of mind, well, you can guarantee what would happen. Uh, nothing at all. So what's different about personal relationships? Well, one difference is you get involved with persons. You get emotionally involved. You see, physicists don't get emotionally involved with Higgs bosons. They don't say, I love you, Higgs boson, uh, and then get offended when the Higgs boson doesn't respond. They don't do that. The Higgs boson is an object. 
But the fundamental thing about other persons is you must never treat them as objects. You must always treat them as persons who have their own views, who have their own passions, and who can interact with you and be changed by you, but change you in the process. So you're changed by other people. You're not changed by Higgs bosons. You can carry out as many scientific experiments as you'd like, and it won't change your emotional life at all. But you enter into a proper relationship with another person, and you will be changed. I notice I've been married for about 45 years now, and my wife and I often think the same thoughts. We certainly didn't do that when we started out. Now we do. It's, it's got a bit strange, really, because we sometimes know what we're saying before we say it, and it gets a bit annoying in a sense, really. And, uh, she says, I don't know what you're going to say, and I have to think of something else instead. Uh, <laughs> but people do sort of grow together and get changed by each other. Now, this is very important. Religion is about personal relationship. It's not about scientific, objective experimentation. But the new atheists try to make religion into something scientific and objective. So when they say believing in the gods or worshipping a god is actually explaining scientifically why the sun rises, they've got the whole thing completely wrong. It's like saying music exists to explain why violins play. Music doesn't exist for that reason at all. Music doesn't exist to explain anything. Music exists to reveal something to you, something of beauty, something of profundity, something you could really call transcendent, something that takes you out of yourself and shows you things you might never have thought. It's disclosive. It's changing. It changes you. Personal relationships are like that. But science is not like that. It's not. However wonderful science is, and I'm all for science, it doesn't do that to you. So the new atheists have got religion wrong. They're religion blind. It's like somebody, you know, who is tone deaf talking about music. They wouldn't know what they were talking about. They wouldn't ever have had a musical experience. Right? And so when they talk about religion, they haven't got the slightest idea what they're talking about. They've never had a religious experience. They don't know what it would be to feel the sense of the presence of God. They have no idea of that. There's nothing that's ever touched them and changed their lives by its moral force and by its spiritual force. That sense of transcendence that might come in lots of different contexts. St. George's Cathedral, Perth, Western Australia. This is part two of the lecture, The New Atheists, by Professor Keith Ward. So I want to make a big difference between two sorts of explanation, scientific and personal. So let's just spell out a little bit what that would be. A scientific explanation is like this. What you do is you try, first of all, to measure what you're talking about. If you're a scientist, you want to put a value on it. You want to put a measurement, right? You, you want to get the temperature. You want to get the pressure. So you quantify. You put a value. You put a number on what you're talking about. You measure it. And then you experimentally control it. You put it into test situations and carry out experiments, and you predict what it's going to do next. And preferably in science, you try to make an equation. So as to say, if this happens, if X happens, if I drop a ball from the leaning tower of Pisa, it will fall at a certain rate to the ground. And so you make a mathematical equation saying exactly what that force of gravity will be. So it's a law in accordance with which things always happen in a regular way. So what you've got in a scientific explanation are three things. You've got, you can measure it. You can measure the values of the things you're looking at. You can make a regular uh, law which says what will happen every time from a given situation. And you carry out, you have experimental, public, testable confirmation of what happens. And when you've got that, you've got a good scientific explanation. I believe you should push that as far as you can. You should seek for explanations in science as far as you can. There is nothing in religion which stops any investigation in science. In fact, the best science has been done by the most religious people, so why should there be anything that stops you doing that? But if you're talking about a personal explanation, that is different. In a personal explanation, you have these elements. First of all, uh, you have knowledge, awareness, if you explain, what I mean by personal explanation is this. I ask the question, why did you come here tonight? You may be wondering, but why did you come here tonight? 
A personal expression will say, well, you knew it was happening. You had the knowledge that it was happening. You evaluated the event. You thought, on the whole, I think it'll be interesting. I give it a positive value, better than watching whatever is on television. And so you evaluate it. And then you actually intend to get here. You set out. You say, I'm going to do that. So you, you set in motion a causal process which gets you here. And then, hopefully, you enjoy it. Or at any rate, you experience it. Okay. So consciousness is very important to a personal explanation. See, in science, consciousness is not a relevant factor. Okay. You eliminate thinking about consciousness. Uh, you don't ask about it. You're looking at the objects of consciousness. You're just looking at objects. But in personal explanation, consciousness is essential. It's what you know, what you evaluate, what you'll experience, what you intend. So those are the elements of personal explanation. Knowledge, evaluation, intention. And you say you've given a perfectly good personal explanation when you say, I came here tonight because I thought it would be interesting and I decided to come and I set out and I got here. And that's a personal expression. You've answered the question, why did you come? And you haven't said anything about your electrons or you know, your, your actual chemical bits or whatever's going on. That's different. That would be a scientific explanation. And of course we get both. We can have both. We can have a scientific explanation and a personal expression. No, no difficulty. They're different sorts of things. Well, I want to suggest to you that religion is about a personal explanation and science is obviously about scientific explanation and you can have both and they don't conflict, they don't contradict, they're different sorts of explanations. And the personal explanation is, well, the universe exists. Why does this universe exist? Because there is a, a supreme consciousness, a conscious reality, which has knowledge of every possible universe that could exist which evaluates those universes and which intends to create, to bring into existence one of them. And that's a personal explanation. You've answered the question. Why does the universe exist? Because God, knowing all possible universes that could exist, chose this one to exist for a good reason. What's the good reason? There's nothing difficult about that. The good reason is what a good reason is for any person. Namely, that it's valuable. It is worthwhile. It's valuable for God. God enjoys it. God creates the universe because God appreciates the beauty of the universe. So the general answer to why would a universe exist from a personal point of view is because it realizes forms of goodness, of value, of worthwhile existence, which otherwise would not exist. Let's just compare that with the many worlds theory of quantum physics for a moment. On the many worlds theory, all possible universes actually exist. On the God theory, God as a personal explanation of the universe, it's not true that all possible universes exist in reality, but they all do exist in the mind of God as possibilities. On the God hypothesis, God chooses one of them for the sake of the distinctive values that that universe contains. On the many worlds hypothesis, nobody chooses, they just all exist. Now, if you ask which of these is the more plausible theory, okay, one is a theory in physics, the other is not a theory in physics. It's about a personal explanation, which, as I've said, is not a scientific explanation, but it still is an explanation. Which is the better explanation? Well, I'm in no doubt at all that God is the much better explanation. Why? Because, well, first of all, the many worlds theory is morally unacceptable. The many worlds theory says every possible universe exists. Every possible universe exists. So there is a universe in which tonight, before I came to give this talk, I killed and ate the dean. That's a possible universe. It's a possible state of affairs. So if you say that universe actually exists, then every terrible universe that could ever be actually exists. And that is morally unacceptable. So you're going to have every possible universe, however good and however bad. I mean, this universe is bad enough. But for a believer in God, it is a creatable universe. It contains lots of bad things, true, but it also contains good things that couldn't exist without those bad things and that couldn't exist at all if the, this universe didn't exist. 
So at least this universe is a creatable universe. And remember that Christians believe that this universe is not the end of human lives. That human lives continue beyond this universe so that although there is lots of pain and suffering in this universe for a Christian, we certainly believe that that pain and suffering will be used for good in a life beyond this. So you add that to the God hypothesis. If you think this universe is really just too bad to exist, that makes it not true that it's too bad to exist. It's a difficult, it's a tragic universe, but it may uh, bring about forms of goodness which otherwise couldn't exist. So I think the God hypothesis is morally preferable to the hypothesis that every world, however terrible, has to exist. But let's not think about morality. Let's just think about probability. Which is more probable? That there is one conscious mind, the mind of God, which envisages all possible universes and creates one of them and brings it to good? Is that more or less probable than the view that every possible universe actually exists? That's an infinite number of universes. I think most people would agree that the existence of any universe like this one is highly improbable. All right? So this universe, with all its uh, laws and uh, the way that those laws integrate to form complex carbon-based beings like us, this universe is a highly improbable universe. That's, that's bound to be true. But of course, if there is a God who brings it into being for a purpose, then this universe wouldn't be highly improbable anymore. It would be highly probable that God would create a universe which contains forms of goodness and other beings who can be free and act creatively. That's not as improbable as a universe which just exists by chance. So the God-created universe is much more probable than the chance universe. More than that, however... It is much more probable, be careful about this one, it is much more probable that one improbable universe should exist than that an infinite number of improbable universes should exist. I mean, it's, that's pretty obvious when you think of it. Right? So the many worlds theory is each universe is improbable, but they all exist. So you've got an infinite number of improbabilities multiplied I mean, that just defeats the imagination, really. So it's obvious that the one God-created universe is much more probable than the many worlds theory, which is infinitely improbable. Okay? At least this universe is not infinitely prob improbable. It's just a bit unlikely without God. So if you're asking the question, which is more probable, a God-created universe or a chance universe, I think there's no competition. The God-created universe is more probable. So I think it's more sensible to be a theist, a believer in God, than not. Now, some people don't understand probability theory very well. Some of the new atheists in particular don't understand it very well, and they can't work this out. And one of the arguments that Richard Dawkins uses, he thinks it's a conclusive argument against God. It, it's the very opposite. His conclusive argument against God is this. If you've read the God delusion, I hate even to mention it, but there it is. If you've read that, you'll know he says there's one argument which uh, shows there isn't a God. And that argument is this, that this is a very complex and improbable universe. So if it has a creator, then that creator must be even more complex and improbable than the universe. So there are two axioms involved in this totally invalid argument. The two axioms are, first of all, that a complex entity like the universe, if it has a creator, must have a creator who is more complex than the universe. That's one axiom. And the other axiom is the more complex a thing is, the less probable it is, the less likely it is to exist. Both these axioms are almost certainly false. Let me just demonstrate that that is true. It's a complete proof. 
First of all, it's simply not true in mathematics that a complex entity needs to be brought about by a more complex entity. It's the opposite of the truth. In fact, Dawkins, who believes in the theory of evolution, himself believes that complex entities evolve from simple entities. So he himself refutes his own view. I mean, he thinks, yes, complicated things like human brains do evolve from very simple things like amoeba. So the complex can be brought about by the simple. Well, okay. So that refutes the axiom that a complex universe would have to be brought about by something even more complex. But the real thing about this is you can't compare the complexity of God with the complexity of the universe. The universe is complex in this sense, that it's made up of lots of parts. Let's call them atoms or electrons. We know that's complicated, but let's just say they're electrons. And the universe is made up of lots of electrons, and those electrons could be, in principle, taken apart, uh, so the universe could be decomposed into its constituent parts. The universe is complex, and it's made up of lots of parts stuck together in complicated ways. But God is not complex in that sense. God is, by definition, a cosmic consciousness, a cosmic mind. Consciousness, your consciousness, my consciousness, any consciousness, is not made up of separate parts stuck together. It can't be pulled apart into different bits. Consciousness is essentially unitary. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you think, everything is part of one experience that you're now having. And that experience is unitary. You can't put it apart. You can't compose it out of other things. And traditionally, theologians have said, uh, God is simple meaning that God is unitary, you know, God is not made up of bits. And so you can't say that God is more complex than the universe because you're talking about different sorts of things. The universe is complex because it's made up of lots of physical bits, but God is not made up of lots of physical bits. God is not physical at all. God is pure consciousness. So the argument that a complex universe must be made by some being more complex, but of the same sort, is completely false. God is not of the same sort, and God is not complicated in that sense. So the universe can have a unified consciousness, which is the source of its being. And in fact, quantum physicists, they might, without using the word God, would say this space-time does in fact uh, have an origin which is simpler than the universe. It's made of um, a balance of gravitational and inflationary energies and the basic quantum laws of the universe. And that's not like the universe and it's not more complex. So that, the argument is just totally without any foundation. It's not even worrying for a theist. It doesn't even begin to work. And the other part of the argument, uh, which is that the more complex things are more improbable than simple things, well, that's not true either. Because this is where probability theory is very important. In probability theory, you can't have a probability without a reference class. Let me give you an example. There's, uh, you put 10 balls in a bag, nine white ones and one black one. You close the bag and you say, what's the probability that I'll pick? Uh, did I say 10 white ones? I can't remember. No. Ten, anyway, let's, let's start again. 10 white ones and one black. And you close the bag and you say, what's the probability of picking out a black ball? And you can say exactly what it is. It's one in 10. Because you know how many balls there are. And you know how many black ones there are. So you know your reference class. You know the number of balls in the bag. And you know how many white ones and how many black ones there are. And then you can say what the probability is. With the lottery, the same sort of thing is true. People, mathematicians are employed to decide how much money they should give out in the lottery and how many numbers you'd need to have to make not many people win the lottery. So mathematics is used in the lottery, but mathematics is used because you do know roughly how many people will play and how much money you'll need to give out to make it worthwhile. Right? So you use mathematics, you use probability theory, but you know the data, you know how many people are involved, how much money is involved. Okay. So you now apply probability to the question, is God more or less probable than the universe? Okay. Now Dawkins' argument is, the universe is highly improbable, but God is even more improbable. But that's actually false. 
And the reason it's false is that if you're asking which is more probable, God or the universe, you don't have a reference class. You don't know how many balls there are in the bag, right? How many universes are there? Now you say, how likely is this universe? Well, if there are an infinite number of universes, then it's infinitely unlikely, presumably. But you really don't know how many universes. So you've got nothing to go on. How likely is God? You haven't got the slightest idea. You don't know what you're measuring it against. So the bottom line is this. And all probability theories agree with this. It's not a question. It's a mathematical truth. It is that you cannot assess the probability of something existing when you have no idea of what things could exist. Right? And we have no idea of what things could exist. We don't know what sorts of other universes there could or could not be. We don't know whether God could or could not exist. We just don't know those things. So we can't assess the probability. So my conclusion is it's a complete, absolute, fundamental refutation of Dawkins' favorite argument. It is not the case that this universe, which is indeed very improbable on its own, taken uh, against the reference class of the other possible gravitational laws they could be. You've got a reference class. But this universe does not have to be brought into being by something which is of the same sort as it, physical, and which is more complicated than it. And the theory of evolution itself gives you an example of a case where that's not true. And secondly, you can't anyway assess the probability of God or the universe, so you cannot say God is more improbable than the universe. QED. What you can say is that this universe would be more likely to be the way it is if it had been created by a God. You can say that. Because it is very unlikely indeed that the laws of gravity, uh, the gravitational constant, Planck's constant, etc., the laws of m mechanics and motion, very unlikely that it would all have come together in the very precise way that is needed if it's to produce carbon-based beings like us. That's very unlikely. Uh, whereas if there was a god who decided to do this, then this universe would be very likely. So that, that's much better, obviously. So then you're left with God versus the universe. We've been there, done that. Uh, you can't assess those probabilities. Right? So there's no good argument against God in Dawkins' work at all. Right, so that's the bit about saying, look, there's an important difference between scientific explanation and personal explanation. Religion is actually concerned with personal explanation. That's a different sort of thing. And, of course, personal explanation will only work for you if you think that consciousness is an objective element of reality. It's not, uh, uh, it's not non-existent. It does exist. It's part of reality. But I think most of us do think that, don't we? Daniel Dennett doesn't think that. He, th he thinks consciousness is reducible to movements of neurons in the brain. But I'm sure most of us don't think that. Let me try one little experiment with you. People who are materialists, and that's the argument. See, the argument about God is not an argument about whether people do stupid things in church. The argument about God is whether the ultimate nature of reality is materialistic or more like consciousness. Is this a spiritual universe or a material universe? That's the argument. Now, every great philosopher has been on the spiritual side, has said it's a spiritually based universe. Every quantum physicist would say, well, even if I don't believe that, it's a very good, reasonable theory. And I've tried to argue tonight that it's actually the most reasonable theory there is. My conclusion about that, in other words, is as follows. Believing in God is not irrational. It's the most rational belief there is. So people who oppose faith to reason have got it completely wrong. Faith is the reasonable option. If you don't believe that this universe is a rational, beautiful, elegant universe, you're setting yourself against the whole of science. And if you do believe the universe is like that, well, the simplest and most elegant and most beautiful way of conceiving that is to say, it's the mind of God, which is intelligent and beautiful, which is bringing this universe into being. So I would say faith is supremely rational. And I regret the day anybody made up the expression uh, that faith is a leap beyond reason. I know exactly who said that. It was Søren Kierkegaard, uh, and he was, like most people I'm talking about tonight, wrong. Right. 
Faith is not a leap beyond reason. Faith is precisely a trust in reason. If Christians have got something wrong, is that that they're too reasonable. I mean, if you're an atheist, you ought to be saying, this universe is chaotic, it has no reason for being the way it is, it's accidental, it's an amazing thing that anything ever goes right at all, and you never know what's going to happen next, and it's all just one damn thing after another. No reason at all. But if you're a Christian, you'll say, of course there's a reason for this universe. It is intelligently planned to bring about things which God considers to be good. And therefore, it is rationally constructed on rational laws, which rational minds can understand. And it's because of that that science works. Because science is the uncovering of the rational principles on which the universe works. So science and religion are the closest of friends. And it's a tragedy that some zoologists think this is not true. So that's a bit of a mystery, why that should be true. But there are other things, I suppose, still to mention. And uh, I suppose uh, one of them would be, is it possible to believe in God without any evidence? So let's move on to that. Is it possible to believe in God without evidence? You see, most of my atheistic colleagues, and in Oxford I have quite a few atheistic colleagues, uh, would say, what's your evidence? And the question here is, well, evidence only works within a system that you already accept. If you've got the system set up, you can then ask for evidence within the system. But let, let me ask one or two philosophical questions, right? because this is a philosophical issue. Is there evidence for God? So my first question would be this. Is there evidence that anybody else is ever thinking about anything? Well, after starting off at the University of Wales, I went to the University of Oxford, and I was taught by somebody they called Freddie Eyre, A.J. Eyre. He was the great atheist. He was the Dawkins of uh, you know, the 50s. And Freddie Eyre didn't believe in God until, I might say, he died. Um, and when he died, he met God. And I, I know that's true, because he came back to life again and said, my God, I've just met God. It's most disconcerting. I'm an atheist. I even read an article about it in the papers. <laughs> anyway, that's a, a story that we could go into. But uh, Freddie Eyre did have a rather disconcerting near-death experience. It didn't actually make him believe in God. It made him think twice about his philosophy, though. But A.J. Eyre was a great th- um, atheist. Uh, and uh, when he was teaching, he, he believed... I won't go into detail about this, but I don't want to get too boring. But he believed that um, you start in your knowledge of the world from what he calls sense data, that is colors, sounds, touches, things that you experience. You start from things in your immediate experience. And then you construct the physical world of independent objects out of those sense data. But if you look at other people, all you get is sense data of their bodies. So how do you know they've got any minds? I mean, you might all be robots for all I know. Or I might be a robot for all you know. Have you seen the film The Matrix? It's quite a good uh, illustration of this point. They're all actually not what they think they are. They've all, they're all being given illusory experiences by some machine. Okay. But how do we know that we're not plugged into some machine which is making us think that we're sitting here in Perth Cathedral? Well, we don't know. We just assume we're not. It's too complicated a theory to think about. But air seriously held that you had you had no evidence for other minds, that other people were having thoughts, right? So their thoughts are hidden from you. Let let me take a specific example. Last night, I wonder if you had a dream. I bet some of you had a dream last night. Now, if I ask you what you dreamt about last night, I wouldn't be able to check that what you said was correct or not. I say... Did you dream last night? You tell me, yes, I dreamt I was in the Bahamas or somewhere where it doesn't rain as much as it does in Perth. And uh, then uh, I I just had to believe you, really, because I couldn't ever check that you were right. I've got no way of testing that. I couldn't verify it. I couldn't show it was true. So Freddie Eyre, who believed in the verification principle, you must be able to verify everything, had big trouble with other people's dreams because he could never verify that they'd ever had any dreams. Now, the point is this. Here is something. I believe you dreamt last night, if you say you did, but I have no evidence for that. You're saying you dreamt. is not evidence. It's just you're just saying you did. 
It's testimony, but it's not evidence. There is no evidence. You can't have any evidence. And in general, I'm telling you what I'm thinking now. I'm thinking out loud. Right? But if I thought to myself and I just sat in a corner, you could never get any evidence as to what I was thinking. You'd never know. If I was clever, I could make sure you'd never know. There are people who conceal their thoughts for the whole of their lives. They're called bankers. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so there are lots of ways in which you never really know what somebody else is thinking. But they perhaps do. So evidence is actually not always obtainable. It's not appropriate to ask for evidence for everything. And in particular, you can't get evidence for what's in other people's minds. Unless they express it. I mean, they can tell you. They can tell you what's in their mind, or they can perform some gestures which express what's in their mind. But if they don't, you'll never know what's in their mind. Well, now remember, if God is the supreme mind underlying the whole of physical reality, there couldn't be any evidence for what was in God's mind. Unless God said what was in God's mind, unless there was revelation, in other words, you would have no way of knowing what was in God's mind. So evidence is not actually appropriate here when you're talking about minds and of course what the new atheists are thinking about when they're talking about evidence they're thinking about uh, as though God was a physical thing and that's again a total misrepresentation we don't think God is a physical thing when they refer to God as a fairy or as, as a sort of strange sort of uh, ethereal being uh, they're thinking well it, God's made of matter but a very thin sort of matter or they're thinking, oh, Christians really think God's like God drawn by Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel roof, all right? If any Christian thinks that, I wish they'd just go away and give up because God is nothing like that. And you couldn't read the Bible and think that anyway. God is not male. God doesn't have a beard. I mean, God is not representable. The first principle of the Bible is you shall not make any image of God at all. No image. Jesus is a complication. Let's leave him out just for tonight. Uh, but with regard to God, you could say you can't make an image of God. Some Christians have, and I think that's dreadful, really, really theologically obtuse. Uh, so, if there's no image of God, God, it's because God is a pure mind. And you can't make an image of a mind. What would you do? What would you begin to do? You, you can't do it. So that's why there can't be evidence. Let me push this just a little further. Let's go back to your dreams that you had last night. Not only can I not verify what you dreamt about last night, neither can you. You had the dream, but you can't verify that you had it. You can't go back to it and say, oh, yeah, that's the dream I had. You can't do that. You just remember it. Well, how do I know that you're right? How do you know that you're right? You could misremember it. In fact, I have some philosopher friends who say people never dream at all. They just wake up thinking they dreamt. <laughs> if you believe that, you believe anything. But philosophers can believe anything, and they do, so there you are. So all you've got are you wake up thinking that you've dreamt, but you can't check that you did. And that's quite an important point. So here are some ordinary, every day, or at least every night, experiences that you have, that you have no evidence for, and that you cannot yourself check in any way. You just have to believe without evidence that you dreamt of something last night. So God's not the only thing that doesn't have evidence. There are lots and lots of things. No fact of history can be checked, right? Did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? My daughter went to a French school, and I assure you, she was told Napoleon did not lose the Battle of Waterloo. It was a victory which took the form of a tactical withdrawal. <laughs> but did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? Well, of course, you might have documents. In that sense, there could be evidence if you believe that the documents are authentic. But you can't actually check what happened in the past. You can't verify it. A.J. Ayer used to say, oh, you, you could in principle go back in the past and look, but that's ridiculous. We know you can't go back in the past. So no historical fact can be checked either. It can't be actually, you can't stand in front of it and say, I know that it's true. The point I'm making here is just it's, it's, it's wrong to ask for that sort of evidence for God. When God is pure mind underlying everything in the universe, you can't 
ask the question, well, what physical uh, thing could I see that is evidence for God? Unless God intends it to be. God could intend there to be evidence of a sort, like the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps, something like that. But apart from that, uh, he wouldn't expect. So evidence is the wrong question. So I conclude, really, that what's wrong with the new atheists is they try to make God into a material thing, but a very thin material thing, and a very stupid material thing who's always making arbitrary decisions and deciding that when people ask for a car parking space, he may or may or not do it, depending on what he feels like at the time. But what you've got to think about God is get away from all those ideas and just say God is the mind, the consciousness, which is intelligent and beautiful and underlies the whole of this physical cosmos without which it would not exist. And if you go back to one of the greatest of all Christian theologians, Thomas Aquinas, that's what he says. He doesn't say God is a being who is just outside the universe and keeps interfering with it every now and again. He says God is being. The ex one expression he uses is essay suum subsistence, which you could translate as being itself. God is pure being. So all things have being, things like us, contingently. We, we receive being. We live, then we die. God alone is being. God is the ultimate principle of existence beyond every image. And Aquinas absolutely insisted that God is not a substance, it's not a thing, it's not a finite thing in or outside the universe. God is the conscious basis of the existence of everything in the universe. So, new atheists, should theists be concerned? Not in the slightest, except they should be concerned that people's view of religion has become so naive that they think the new atheists have a point. But the being that the new atheists criticize is not the God of Christianity or of Judaism or of Islam or of most Indian religions too because, as a matter of fact, most, the vast majority of Indian religions are monotheistic. And they would say, well, the different gods are all faces, different faces of the one supreme God. So I would think that one thing that counts against the arguments of the new atheist is that, in fact, the philosophical arguments for materialism, upon which atheism is based, are very weak. You know, I have many colleagues in philosophy. I'm on the council of the Royal Institute of Philosophy in England, so I know all the teaching professional philosophers there. And if, if you ask me how many materialist philosophers are there, the answer is I can count them on the fingers of two hands. The vast majority of philosophers are not materialists, do not think materialism is a very reasonable view to hold. So, of course, that's only philosophers, and I can just imagine what Richard Dawkins says about philosophers, uh, uh, people who sit around in armchairs with their eyes shut. But uh, still, uh, if you're thinking about intellectual argument, you know, philosophers are usually quite good at that. So not many materialists. More to the point, perhaps, not many physicists are materialists. I mean, you wouldn't find many quantum... You would find no quantum physicists who are materialists. And what they believe, they might not call God because they still think God is this arbitrary father figure in the sky, but it comes very close to that intelligent source of all physical reality. Also, the new atheists lack completely a historical sense of how religion has developed over many millennia uh, and how, of course, primitive forms of religion are very unlike present-day forms of religion. Obviously they are. And in the Bible, you actually get the best record of a progress in religious understanding towards one view of God, which is very like the one I've tried to put forward tonight. Uh, so you get a development of that view. And of course, again, what people like Dawkins do is take you back to the most primitive parts of the Bible and say, ah, that's what you really believe, a vicious tyrant who tells you to kill all the Amalekites. And what you have to say is, look, this was written in the Bronze Age. What were your ancestors doing in the Bronze Age? Um, you know, were they all highly intelligent, sophisticated people? And it developed. That few developed. And, and nobody can read the words of Jesus and think you ought to go around the world looking for the last Amalekite. You know, you'd say, no, those were primitive things that people believed then. But nobody, no Jew, no Christian, is going to believe that now. No intelligent 
informed one anyway, and no theologian, somebody who's paid to try to understand the basis of the Christian faith. Last point. How can atheists like the new atheists preserve a sense of the dignity, the moral worth of human personhood? I don't really think they can. And I know that even Richard Dawkins is worried about that. There seems to be no real basis. You see, if there's a God, then God is an ideal which attracts you to love all of creation and to love human beings as fellow persons who are able together to build communities which change each other as they live together. So morality has its basis in the purpose of God, that supreme cosmic mind for creation. But if there is no God, if we are just the result of millions of accidents, if humanity is just something that nobody ever foresaw or intended and has no purpose and no point at all, why should we value human personhood? That's a really hard question. I don't think that the new atheists are immoral personally. What I think is they have no particular reason for being moral. And in that sense, I think it's very important to say that belief that this universe has a creative mind and therefore a creative purpose gives a basis for the unique dignity of human personality because after all, maybe it's true, we finite minds are minds made in the image of the infinite God. Thank you.